here's the question, basically. So suppose that you have a graph with n vertices. G has uh, no copy of H. Well, you can, and really, all we're going to look at is complete graphs. So you can think of H as just being KR. So G has no copy of this, this graph. And the number of edges in G is only slightly smaller than the extremal number, EXNH. So what we want to kind of look at here is what can we say about the structure of G if it if it doesn't have any copy of H, but the number of edges is just below the extremal number. Um, or actually, we're all also going to cover the case when it's equal to the extremal number. But uh, more generally, we want to say what happens if it's just below. Uh, so what can we say about the structure of the graph? Like, does it have to look like the extremal construction or can it be very different? Um, and essentially, this boils down to, so this word, which is kind of a, a general term in, I mean, in mathematics beyond combinatorics, this word stability. So what we're asking is we're looking for kind of the stability of the optimal constructions uh, for extremal numbers. So are they stable? If I perturb things a little bit, um, or sorry, if I, yeah, if I reduce the number of edges, can I you know, are all the constructions based on perturbing the extremal one, or can you do something completely different, if that makes sense? Okay, so let me give you a, an actual proper theorem here, statement, uh, and then maybe it'll be clear what I'm talking about. So this is a, a theorem of Fioretti from actually just a few years ago, I think 2015 or something. Um, so versions of this was pro were proven before, but this is a particularly nice uh, example, or a nice statement, which is uh, quite new. So here we're dealing with, again, graphs, a graph G, which is KR free. So the number of vertices is N, it's bigger than R, or at least R. And let's say that G has, the number of edges in G is at least, or let's just say it's equal to the extremal number minus T. Uh, actually here, I can actually, I can actually deal with the case, I think T is zero as well. So T is not necessarily at least one, it's at least zero. So suppose that G is a KR free graph with just the number of edges is below the extremal number by t, then what I want to show is that there exists an edge, a set of edges, e1, contained in the edge set of g, and e2, which is in the complement of g. So remember the complement of a graph, uh, the graph, so it's the graph with the same vertex set with the kind of opposite edge set. Uh, v of g complement equals v of g. Um, the edges are, the edges in g complement is all the u and v such that u v is not an edge of g where u and v of course come from the vertex set they're distinct vertices from the vertex set so there's a, a set of edges in g a set of edges in the complement such that if i take g i remove all the edges of e1 and i add the edges of e2 then this is a complete r minus one part type graph and the kind of crucial thing here which is the interesting part is that these sets, I can do this in such a way that E1 and E2 are not very big. So the union of E1 and E2, so the, the edges I delete and the edges I add is at most three times T, which says that, so yeah, if I have a graph which has almost the extremal number of edges, imagine T is some small number like 10, right? The number of edges in G is like 10 below the extremal number. Then what I can do is I can, I can remove a few edges like, and then add a few edges to G to turn it into a complete R minus one part type graph at where the number of edges I delete and add in total is at most uh, 30 if, if, it's, if T is 10. So if you're close to being the, having the extremal number of edges, you're close to the extremal example. Is that clear? Where, yeah, remember these R minus one part type graphs were the extremal examples that we came up with uh, when we were proving Turan's theorem. Okay, so this is a kind of stability type result. If you're close to the optimal number of edges, then you're close close to the optimal construction. So just a, a picture to kind of uh, uh, show what, what we're talking about here. So someone gives you a graph with no KR and this many edges, the extremal number minus T. So what are we looking for? Well, we're looking for a partition of the vertex set into R minus one parts, where the, the kind of property you want is that if I look at the edges inside of the parts, so for example, I look inside of, yeah, I don't know, VR minus one or something. Let's say I color the edges that are inside of a part with uh, blue. 
And then if you look at, you can also look at the edges that are missing between the parts, and I color them red, like those are non-edges, then, then what we want to find is a partitioning, a partition where the number of blue edges, like the extra edges inside the sets, plus the missing edges between the parts, which are red here, is at most three times t. So is it clear why this is equivalent to what we're looking at, we're looking for? So I want to show that g can be made r minus one part type by deleting and adding at most three t edges, and this is the same thing, right? So does all of this seem quite weird, or are we good with it? Yeah. Yeah, so just a, a reminder, yeah, so for when you, yeah, when you want to have a graph that doesn't have a kr and has the maximum number of edges, then yes, that's, the answer is yes. So the, um, an r minus one part type graph is the construction that has the most edges. And, but there's a subtle thing here that actually, uh, what we proved is that to maximize the number of edges, you should take an r minus one part type graph where all the parts have roughly the same size. Okay. We're not actually going to get that here. Okay. I'm going to, I'm going to find that G is close to an R minus one part type graph, but not necessarily that the sizes have the same size or the parts have the same size. Um, but if you did more fiddling around, you could pretty much prove that. But yeah, I won't, uh, I won't prove that part of it. Uh, yeah. So that's the subtle point actually at the bottom of this slide. So, right, the philosophy here again, if, if G has close to the optimum number of edges, then the structure of G is close to the optimal construction is, is the kind of philosophy. And like I said, um, all we're, we're going to do is show that it's close to an R minus one part type graph. I'm, I'm not going to deal with the sizes of the parts, but with more work, you could also prove some stuff about the size of the parts as well. <clears throat> yeah, I guess... Um... Actually, <laughs> actually, that's going that that's uh, that's something that's actually going to come into the proof right at the beginning. Uh, so I was just trying to to digest, make sure this was the same thing. But um, so actually, because of your observation that like, so imagine you add you subtract like s edges or something, then obviously, so you have extremal number minus t, and I subtract s edges or something, then obviously you couldn't add in more than s plus t edges. I think that's that's the and, and that's actually a, a, a key observation that's actually going to be in the proof. So uh, that's a good comment. Um, oh, just a, a kind of uh, a, a side note. So for t equals zero, this actually gives another proof of Turan's theorem. Uh, if you then have, you still have to deal with the case where, you know, proving that the parts should be the same size. <laughs> um, but also it shows that the tight example is unique in Turan's theorem, I think, because if you had a graph which is not uh, R minus one part tight. Yeah, basically what it shows is that for t equals zero, it shows that if you have a optimum example for Turan's theorem, then by adding and removing zero edges, you can make it R minus one part tight. But that just means it is R minus one part tight. So the case t equals zero gives you another proof of Turan's theorem, and it also implies that the optimum examples are unique. Uh, after you, you also have to deal with this uh, this issue about the parts being the same size, but that's not too bad. Okay. So let's get into proving this. So, and yeah, the observation right from the beginning is is going to be the one uh, that was just mentioned. So anyway, so suppose that G is KR free and it has this many edges. And uh, here's a nice observation, which is related to the, the comment that just uh, came up. So all you need to do is show that there exists a set of T edges at most T, such that after I delete those edges, um, the chromatic number of G is at most R minus one. Or in other words, if you don't like chromatic number, you know, after deleting those T at most T edges, I want to show that, uh, this graph can be partitioned into R minus one independent sets. And the reason why is, well, so it's on the next slide, but I can also just write it here. You know, after deleting, uh, T edges or at most T edges, G has this many edges, extremal number, so at least extremal number of kr minus 2t edges, and g is r minus 1 part tight. So, so like, this is assuming, assuming that this set of t edges, at most t edges exists, right? So assuming this, then, um, <clears throat> then I delete those edges, the number of edges went down by at most t, so it's still at least extremal number minus 2t, 
And by deleting those edges, I made it R minus one part tight. So if you think of how many edges I could add, um, it's not more than 2t because, or so sorry, the number of edges I need to add to make it complete R minus one part tight. So the number of edges I need to add to make it complete R minus one part tight is at most 2t because in fact, there's no way it could be larger because imagine, imagine I could add 2t plus one vert edges uh, to make it, and it would still R minus one part tight then it would have more edges than the extremal number, um, which is certainly more edges than any r minus one part tight graph can have. Yeah, so why is g r minus one part tight after deleting t edges? Um, just because that's the, so that's the assumption I'm making. And then I wanna say, so I guess I'm saying, I'm trying to prove this sen sentence that all we need to do is delete at most t edges or find at most t edges that we can delete so that it's r minus one part tight. I'm trying to show that that's enough to finish the whole proof. Um, yeah, so the, the point is, after I delete t edges, and if it's r minus one part tight, if you think of, if, you, if there exists like more than two t edges that I could add and keep it r minus one part tight, that would contradict the definition of the extremal number. So you can't add like two t plus one edges while keeping it the graph. Uh, I'm not sure if that explanation is very good, um, but that, yeah. But because if you were able to, you know, otherwise you'd have more than the extremal number of edges and you'd have no KR, that's a contradiction. So otherwise would be greater than EX and KR, but there'd be no KR in the graph, but that contradicts the definition. Okay. So all we need to do is find t edges we can delete um, such that the chromatic number is at, after deleting is at most r minus one. Okay, so that's that's our goal. We have a graph. We want to find t edges um, to delete such that the degree becomes uh, sorry the the chromatic number becomes at most r minus one. So we've got we're going to follow a certain algorithm, which is known as Erdős's degree majorization algorithm. Okay, <clears throat> so here's how the algorithm works. And then I'll kind of draw a picture and uh, we'll think about it some more. But so I'm gonna start by defining V0 plus to be the vertex set of G. By the way, the, the, the thing I'm trying to find, like the output of this in the end is gonna be a partition of the vertex set into R minus one parts. So just to kind of, so all of these sets which have a plus, like V0 plus, they're kind of um, you know, temporary kind of things used in the algorithm, but the output is gonna be the sets VI, okay? So, so now for I at least one, um, if VI minus one plus is empty, then we just stop, okay? And we output the stuff we've constructed. Okay, if it's not empty, if VI minus one plus is not empty, so for example, if we're dealing with v0, it's not empty. Uh, we take a vertex that has, uh, well, which, well, it's in vi minus one plus, and the number of neighbors that, that xi has, so xi is the vertex, the number of neighbors of xi in vi minus one plus is maximum. So so in the, in the first case, right, when we're dealing with v0, we just take, take x1 to be a vertex of max degree. Later, oh, sorry, v0 plus. Later, when we're dealing with v like v10 plus or something, we take a vertex inside of there that has the biggest degree inside of there. So we don't count the edges outside. <clears throat> and then we define um, vi plus to be the neighbors of xi that are in vi minus one plus, And we define vi to be the non-neighbors of xi in vi minus one plus. Okay. In some sense, and and basically, and the things that we're going to output are the are these sets vi, right? We have to show at some point that there's only r minus one of them, but but that's what we're going to output, and that's going to be our partition, which will show that the graph uh, is close to being r minus one part tight. So we want that each of these vi sets is pretty much an independent set. It just has a small number of edges, perhaps. Uh, is this is the definition of the algorithm? Clear? Are people trying to write it down? I'm not sure. Okay. So just to 
to kind of make a picture here. So, um, right, so v, v0 plus was just everything. It's the whole graph. X1 has the biggest degree. And then I'm not sure if this picture really helps that well, that much, but yeah, X, X1 is pick, picked to have the biggest degree. I take its neighbors and I call that V1 plus. I take its non-neighbors and I call that V1. And this picture might be a bit misleading because there can be some edges inside of V1. Okay, so there's some, possibly some edges inside of here. Um, but, and certainly from V1 to V1 plus that you have all, sorry, from X1 to V1 plus, you have all of the edges because that's the neighborhood of X1. Then you pick X2 in here, which has the most neighbors when you zoom in on V1 plus. Ah, good question. Yeah, so X1 is in V1 because it's not a neighbor of itself. So V1 is all the non-neighbors of X1. And then, yeah, X2 is going to be the biggest degree guy here. And then you collect up all of X2's non-neighbors, which are in V1 plus, and that's V2. And all of its neighbors that are in V1 plus becomes V2 plus. Basically, VI plus, um, in the end, it's going to end up being all of the, like, when the algorithm finishes, V1 plus is going to end up being the union of the, like the, the plus is, it kind of makes sense. It's all the parts that come after VI, if that makes sense. Like this kind of explains the notation. So V1 plus is every, is going to be, you know, all of the parts are going to partition V1, V0 plus, and then, yeah, and so on and so forth. We're going to, what we're going to end up doing is not necessarily getting rid of them, but we're going to count them and say that there's not very many internal edges. Um, if we can count these internal edges and show that it's at most T, then we're gonna be done. And then you could, okay, and then you could think of removing them and then adding the missing edges between the parts. But but yeah, so we're gonna count the edges inside the things and those are the ones we think of as removing. Totally, yeah. It's kind of like iteratively pulling out largest neighborhoods, yeah, but you have to make sure that you're looking at the, not the total neighborhood of a vertex, but only its neighborhood into the stuff that hasn't been partitioned yet. In some sense but it is yeah take the biggest neighborhood biggest degree uh and split it up that way oh yeah yeah iteratively yep yeah, exactly you could kind of think of this inductively like i define v1 and then i delete it and then apply the same process to the remaining graph for example yeah okay so what i haven't proven so i i, I wanted to say that you know the number of vi sets is at most r minus one Okay, I haven't actually proven that. So let's actually make sure that that's true. So I take um, S to be the max I such that VI is non-empty. So basically I'm just saying, when does this process stop? Like what's the last thing that gets uh, defined? So I've got V1 up to VS and I claim that um, S is at most R minus one. So can anyone, and there's a bit of a hint here, um, but can anyone see why S is at most R minus one? I guess it takes like thinking something something like that so actually i mean i don't actually know what the chromatic number of this graph is right now but it could be huge but yeah it's something related to what you're saying uh, exactly yeah because yeah if you think about it if i look at x1 right and i look at i think about how i chose x2 x2 is in the neighborhood of x1 right and then x3 okay this picture is going to get terrible but X3 is in like the neighborhood of X2 inside of the neighborhood of X1. So X3 is somewhere in here because, yeah, X2 is in V1 plus, X3 is in V2 plus, X4 is in V3 plus, and so on and so forth. And if you think about that, actually, if you think about it, I think that like VI plus is just the um, intersection of the neighborhoods of X1 up x2 up to x oh dear which way does it go uh xi i think and xi plus one is in here Oop, not equal but right i think that's true so x1 up to xs is a clique so if s was at least r then uh, g would have a kr so certainly this thing will terminate after creating at most r minus one sets Okay. Uh, okay. So just a bit of terminology or 
notation here. Um, so if I have a set of vertices, I define ES. So set S of vertices, I define ES to be the number of edges inside of S. If I have two sets of vertices, I let EST be the number of edges from S to T. Um, there's a little bit of an annoying thing if these things, if these sets are not disjoint. So maybe I'll just say S and T are disjoint here. They have empty intersection. If they're not disjoint, maybe you would have to think about how you want to count the edges that are inside both of them, but let's kind of avoid that. So, um, so our goal now is just to show that if I add up overall i equals 1 up to r minus 1 or s or whatever, um, the number of edges in vi, uh, so then, so if the number of edges in the vi sets, you know, when you add it all up is at most t, then we win because we all we do is we take out the edges from all of, all of these sets and we're left with, well, we've re removed at most t edges and then by this observation earlier, we can add at most two t edges and become a complete r minus one part type graph. So this is what we want to prove, this thing in this blue box. Is that clear? Okay. Okay. So we're going to use this notation. So this E S E S T notation now. Um, okay. Claim. So what happens? So if I take, um, I sum up over all vertices in V1, remember V1 is the set of things not adjacent to X1. Although this doesn't, in some sense, this doesn't actually matter. Um, but anyway, the point is V1 and V1 plus partition the graph, right? And I claim that if I add up all the degrees, so number of vertices in the neighborhood, of course, is just the degree of V, of vertices in V1, that's two times the number of edges in V1 plus the number of, of edges from V1 to V1 plus. And here, yeah, it's be, and here we're going to use the fact that this is a partitioning, right? So does anyone see why this is true? This claim here. So there's something from basic graph theory that's kind of lurking here. Yeah. So I've kind of written this above. It's like the number of neighbors of V, which is the same as the degree. So N of V is like the neighborhood of V, the vertices adjacent to V. So yeah, this is like equal to that. Yep. Yeah. It's kind of like a, a slight, a very slightly upgraded version of the handshaking lemma. But totally, it's it's like by handshaking, I would say, right? Because when I add up all these degrees of vertices in V1, every edge that lives inside of V1 gets counted twice, right? It gets counted from the perspective of that vertex and from the perspective of the other vertex, right? And every, but now if I look at every edge between V1 and V1 plus, it only gets counted once because I'm only adding the degrees over here, of vertices over here, so it just gets counted once because I don't, I'm not adding these guys, uh, these vertices degrees. And also an edge that lives over here doesn't get counted at all because I'm not doing anything with V1 plus, like I'm not adding their degrees. Yeah, so that's right. Handshaking, you know, each edge inside V1 is counted twice. Each, you know, from V1 to V1 plus, uh, counted once and the ones that are inside v1 plus just for complete completeness uh, are counted zero times there's no there's no kind of equivalent to once twice thrice for zero times is there i guess there's nothing for four times either but anyway zero times okay um now similarly so this is exactly the same argument but the same argument works if I kind of zoom in to, I mean, kind of if you think of this this thing recursively, right? How we, like imagine, you could imagine this, I mean, as was mentioned in the chat, you can imagine this algorithm as saying, take the vertex of biggest degree, take its non-neighbors, call that V1, delete it, right? And if you look at what you're left with and you then partition that into V2 plus and V2, you know, the same claim from before is still true, right? Except now we're in a slightly different graph. Um, but basically, yeah, this is the same as before. So if I add up over all the vertices in VI, I, I look at their degree into VI minus one plus. So the number of neighbors they have in VI minus one plus. Um, 
that's going to count every edge inside of VI twice. It's going to count every edge from VI to VI plus once, because here we've got, again, this partitioning. And it's going to count these ones zero times. And like it's going to, any edge that's like living somewhere else, like, you know, gets count zero to, count, counted zero times as well. So it's just equal to this. Okay, so we haven't, we, we chose this vertex VI in a special way, right? We haven't used that yet. The, the fact that we chose it to be the biggest degree vertex. So let's use that. Um, okay, so X is in, remember X, XI was chosen from VI minus one plus to have the biggest degree in that set, like when you only count neighbors in that set. Um, so in particular, if I look at a vertex V and VI, so remember VI is a subset of VI minus one plus. So any vertex V and VI, when we were, like when we were trying to define XI, like each of these vertices V, which is in VI, was a candidate for being XI. Like they had a chance to be XI, um, if they had the biggest degree, then they would be xi, potentially. Um, of course, if there's a tie, we break it arbitrarily. But anyway, all I'm saying here is that the, the number of neighbors that v has in vi minus 1 plus is at most the number that uh, xi has, because, because v is in vi minus 1 plus, right? Because it's in vi, which is a subset of this. So it can't have a degree that's bigger than the biggest degree. Um, and actually, the degree of uh, xi in vi minus 1 plus is just equal to the size of vi plus, because that's just, these sets are just the same set. That's how it was defined. Yeah, there's, uh, there's kind of, uh, there's an annoying thing here that no matter where you kind of break things up, like you always have something which is in, uh, anyway, the, the, I guess this is how things were defined. So it was like, you choose x1 from v0 plus, like v0 plus was the original set, and then x2 comes from x1 plus. It's just, I guess, how the notation was set up in the algorithm, but, and so on. So, so like, if you think of the case i equals 1, then xi is just the biggest degree vertex. But yeah, so, so this is the definition of vi plus. So obviously these have the same size. Um, so now, if I add up, so remember, we were looking at this on the previous slide, the sum of uh, all the degrees. Um, yeah, exactly. So uh, have I got this right, though? Let me just check. Yeah, so this is the sum we had on the previous slide. Sum overall V and VI of the neighborhood into VI minus 1 plus. This is the sum we we uh, wrote in this way. Uh, so, so yeah, this is that sum again, so it's equal to this. And as was just mentioned, it's equal to, is this what you just said, vi and then vi plus? Yeah, right, because each sum and here is at most this, as we just proved, and the number of sum ands is the size of vi. And okay, kind of philosophically here, this is kind of looking good because this, uh, this thing on the left-hand side is counting the edges in vi more than it's counting the edges that go across the like vi to vi plus or so that's actually going to give us a bound if you think about it it's going to it's going to actually give us a bound on the number of edges in in each of the vi sets so let's kind of let's let's finish that off properly so so what we've proven is this thing at the top and like i said this two is very important um so let's sum over all of the indices i so how many times does an edge inside of uh, vi get counted by the left side. Um, and remember, there's a 2 here. So I guess it's kind of clear it gets uh, counted twice. Um, I guess you have to also think about the fact that it's not getting counted in this sum or in this term when we sum up all of those. But that, you know, the edges from... So remember, vi is... Well, vi is just vi. But vi plus... Uh, sorry, vi plus is the... is vi plus 1 union all the way up to vs where you know s was the biggest thing so when i count edges from vi to vi plus i don't count any edges in vi um, 
or even when I count from vj to vj plus for a different j, I'm also not counting any edges in vi. And the edges from vi to vj for i less than j get counted once because they get counted when you consider the, j the ith term, right? But they don't get counted again. So the left-hand side is, um, well, it counts every edge of g at least once, but it counts the ones that live inside the the i sets twice. I don't know whether I should call this s or r minus one, but it doesn't really matter. I'll call it r minus one. If s was less than r minus one, I just let the other sets be empty. Uh, okay. How many edges does g have? Well, we actually like wrote down a number for that in the hypothesis. So g has exactly e x n k r minus t edges, and then we just have this sum again, uh, e v i. Okay. So that's what the left-hand side is equal to. If I, I mean, when I say the left-hand side, I mean if I add up overall i, all of these left-hand sides, it equals uh, this thing. Okay. So now we have to think about what happens when I add up the right-hand side. Um, if you think about it, remember I said that vi plus is just the same thing as vi plus one union dot 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 up to vs or if you like vr minus one. So the, you know, the size of vi plus is just the sum of these sizes because it's a partitioning. So uh, so if you kind of plug that in here, yeah, if you, sorry, the size of vi plus, if you plug that in here and you kind of expand things, uh, you'll see that this is, just like this, so it's this is these sums are equal, um, and this has to be at most the extremal number of kr. Does anyone see why? It's a bit weird. Well, so the reason. Oh, was there a unmuting? Okay, so th this is the this is equal to the number of edges in a complete multipartite graph, or sorry, let's just say r minus one partite or s partite. Anyway, whatever. Uh, s partite graph with the parts being v1 up to vs. So certainly the number of edges in that graph, so that, that would be a graph that doesn't have a kr. Certainly the number of edges in that graph is at most the extreme number of kr. So the right-hand side is at most this. So actually the left-hand side had that same term on it, like this extreme number of kr minus t plus blah, 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 at most Oh, sorry, there should be an E here, or an X, extremal number of KR. You kind of rearrange things, and yeah, boom, you've got uh, exactly what you wanted. The number of edges, if you add up all the edges in all of these sets, is at most T.